I am the Ominous Critic, here once more to deliberate over an item of gaming supply for your consideration. What makes this interesting is that this is an item that is not ancient, it is not impossible to locate, it's just very, very, very new. This item was recently launched by a Kickstarter, a Kickstarter which a close dear friend of mine backed, and it has finally arrived. Unfortunately, as many Kickstarters do, it was quite late from its projected uh, ship date, so my friend was somewhat annoyed by the fact that he wasn't able to use this for what he had planned, even after a good five-month cushion from the launch date. But it's here, and we will begin to look at the merits and misses of the Immersive Battle Maps by Yarrow Studios, created by one Tanner Yarrow, the face of the company that brings this particular game to us, or should I say game accessory. What we have is a large book full of double-sided maps on stiff cardboard that is gridded and uh, treated so that it can be used with dry erase marker or have stickers applied to it. It has a lay-flat spine, which you can see here can be open to any page and still remain flat on a surface so that you can put miniatures upon it. These are conscious design decisions by Mr. Yarrow. Uh, there are a variety of maps which I will be getting into that will be the body of the criticism that I render. However, I can say this, that the initial impression is very favorable the size of the work is quite large. Uh, this is... Uh, maps are 22 inches by 17 inches, which again is a very good sized grid for a scenario and en sized encounter. This uh, appears to be quite well and tightly bound and sealed. The only downside is when unwrapped, it is important to peel the pages apart as the uh, adhesive material that binds the stickers and repels the wet erase marker from staining uh, does need to be separated from its matching mate. That is important and probably one of the biggest stresses these books will have put upon them initially, which case this particular model had a slight problem as when opened there was some separation that did occur between the different layers of the page. A little binding glue should take care of that but it is something to note. Now uh, these came with and uh, were com accompanied by some pages of stickers. Uh, I will go over these stickers as well as part of my closer analysis. Uh, the sticker quality is quite good. There is a wide range between uh, different effects and different props that you might want in the scenes, and uh, that is all appreciated for the use of these books. So, without further ado, we're going to go to the analysis of the books itself, and as we do that, I'm going to describe how we are going to go through things slightly differently here in the Omnis Critic from here on out. So shall we begin? First, we will look at the stickers. As you can see, the stickers are nicely colored with a foil for gold, as found here. It's nice and shiny. Uh, staircases. A large log as a room feature, perhaps. Uh, bags of coins, sarcophagi. A wall to further create uh, separation within the boundaries of the map. Um, a few open treasure chests. This is but the first. Then we also have 
Books of Dungeon Features from uh, Green Scummy Pool, Arcane Symbol, Fireball Cones and Effects, Boats, Catapults, um, some sort of large Doom Roller, Carts, a uh, Tent, useful for setting up a camping scenario, Chairs, Barrels, Crates, Trap Effects, Steeds and Horses, Torches, the torches are, are very nice, Random Weapons, never know when you might be disarmed, a Ballista, Skeletons, uh, Finding the Dead, and then we have a second page of the same effects. And then we also have... Now one of these sheets did come with the book, but uh, I forget which. Anyhow, uh, these are spell effects. Uh, fog cloud or cloud kill, a wall of vapor, large boulders, um, some sort of skull death effect. Um, the ears are so that if somebody hears something, you can put a general alert in an area so the players can then uh, ponder whatever the item is, so whatever is possibly going to assail them. Um, uh, different stages of awareness, alert statuses, tracks. This all could go very well towards stealth gameplay. Um, I believe these might be motorcycles or cannons. I'm not sure which. They're not very well illuminated. I believe these are doors. Oh, and, uh, traps. I actually like the presence of uh, a couple of good man-stoppers or bear traps. And then we have two pages with identical pages. Tracks. Uh, especially useful for the mines or city streets that there are some sort of a trolley, broken doors, a dispatched dragon, uh, some sort of energy or water field. Um, I believe those are mine carts here. Uh, broken carts, traps, spikes looks like, uh, bear skin, more tents for your camping enjoyment, or you can use them as stalls in a bazaar, trees, a small hut, so, a variety of interesting effects. These, I believe, are supposed to be switches. I think it could also use them as windows to separate out and show different methods of egress or for light to get into your, uh, into your dungeons. So, here we have the book itself. Um, it is a rather large book, in, in all uh, fairness which lends itself to large-scale uh, encounters. We are going to go over this quickly. It is not my intention to individually critique every single uh, map, but you will get a good idea by the time we are done of what's involved. Uh, Atlas Mundi, Map of the World, presents Table of Contents, and these are all of the different maps. And I'm, again, not going to go back to that very often. I think you'll get a good idea of what each of the maps are as we go through. So we have a castle wall scenario, and kind of an open field, and let's just tilt back a little bit, shall we? Yeah, so let's do that. So here we have our first map. It's a siege environment. You have a castle wall. You have an open field in front. No moat or anything, so it's just open terrain. You have a few ballistas here, towers, um, large uh, mortars for dumping molten lead or acid or oil onto your foes, all the fun things that you can do. Barrels and things. This has the grid very nicely arranged so that you can easily set your miniatures upon it. Although this being the first one, it will be a little bit of a sag so that your miniatures might slide just a touch. As we see here, uh, this little ratman will do. Uh, but yes, as you can see, it stays pretty well. And again, this is treated to be uh, able to be written on in dry erase marker, which I'm not going to do at the moment, but uh, the surface feels appropriate for that. 
So, as we can see here, some pretty high resolution images uh, showing the castle, the individual flags on top of the castle flagstones, um, walls and barriers, uh, a very good sense of this, the scope of what assailing a castle might be like. A little cluttered, but uh, I assume that it would be fairly cluttered for anybody who would be on such a wall, so. So here we see a dockside. This would be suitable for a dock battle, a ship that's a bit beat up and, and chewed on, aside a, a much better conditioned ship. This is an area that is dynamic and ready for a battle. Um, many uh, encounters often are a matter of opportunity, and given this scenario, uh, I can imagine that all sorts of opportunities now rear th themselves for battles that can involve knocking people into the water or having to cross open space to get to a ship, which itself might be a multi-dimensional battle. Uh, again, too, note that the you can see individual planks on the boats. Uh, the resolution is quite nice and fairly consistent. It's an open battlefield, and uh, it uh, would work quite well. We get into a hedge maze. Uh, quite nice. This could be very easily covered up and concealed so that the players might take their figures and go through the hedges as they explore through. There are light sources patterned out so that you can see where, what's where and why. And there is a central, I would say, a gazebo in the center. Um, there are areas where the path is uh, clearly um, bricked for durability, but the hedges are all around. Again, nice resolution, looks quite good. Now we come to a map that begins to show some of the weaknesses of this work. We have here what appears to be an inn, a tavern of sorts, numerous tables and barrels of all sorts, um, outer walls, but we look at the edges and the boundaries are right up against the edges, the cornerstone mantlets of this wall. Not terrible at this stage. Um, but you can see here, there, it's, it's quite tight. It uses the space as much as it can. A little bit of the backyard, a little bit of the foreyard in the front. But uh, raised dais in the center. It's got uh, numerous items in its layout that kind of excite the imagination and how you can interact with it. And having a good layout for a tavern, for a scenario like a bar brawl or a tavern encounter, is, is very nice to have. Again, too, we notice that Resolution-wise, this one is done fairly well. Almost everything is uh, shaded well, uh, good gradients, and uh, the outer terrain kind of gets a little murky and muddled, but that's not the focus of this. So, again, quite nice. Now we get to a pig farmer's. We know it's a pig farmer because there's a waller here with a pig in it. Uh, a scrabby looking field. Uh, dynamic, there's a stream going through the middle with a crude bridge, a tiny little house. This house is very, very, very small, um, which might be appropriate for a very poor farmer, but he's got a huge chest in there as well. One large bed that takes up almost a quarter of the, the place. Um, this is kind of an odd layout, really. Um, the, I can appreciate the size, but the furniture just doesn't seem to fit it very well, um, all in all. Large hearth, uh, this kind of crowded. It looks like things were just dropped in without bothering to resize them. If you look, this chest is seven feet wide. Uh, this is somewhat of nitpicking, but this space isn't very usable as a result, which is unfortunate. We also start to see that the finer textures that we had seen before are really starting to get muddled and muddied here. The road is particularly dreadfully um, detailed, although there are some sharp edges uh, along some of the boundary lines, but you're losing a good deal of detail here as you go. Uh, the other terrain is mostly a wash of browns and grays, green, muddy greens, so 
Uh, that's not lovely to look at, but this is, again, something that you're going to use as a quick dynamic battlefield, and most adventurers aren't going to want to spend a great deal of time here anyway. We get to a, an outdoor bazaar. Stalls around a central statue. Rooftops overlooking it so that you can set up some very interesting multi-level encounters. Um, you have a couple of stanchions here to uh, secure horses to, perhaps, or um, wagons so that they don't go walking away. Uh, all in all, this would do very well as a an opening for a bazaar if you want to have uh, a, a, an encounter where the players meet with somebody or have a battle in a town bazaar. Uh, again, nice, nice map to have. Here we have a Dwarven Forge, complete with lava channels for providing that heat. Uh, weapons bedeck the area. Um, again, scaling seems to be an issue. This sword, from tip to end, is over 10 feet tall. Um, you know, this broadsword would be well over five and a half feet long, so that would be a very unwieldy, this would be a great sword, this would be, I don't know, a giant's sword, perhaps? So scaling is not, unfortunately, the strength of Mr. Yarrow. Um, but here we have, again, crisp detail, quite nice. And we go to a split-level house. Uh, this is a level above this one. You can see the stairs going down that match up with that one. Um, again, the idea of a... This is a, more of a noble's house. And we have a... Over here we have kind of a dining area with plates and things. We have a hearth, kind of a common room. We have a wine cellar with barrels and such. Uh, a foyer, more barrels... Um, up here we have a bedroom, servant's chamber, there's no kitchen. There's nothing here for some of the living th necessities you would need in something this large. Um, so, again, his, the layout that Mr. Yarrow chooses is uh, a little questionable as far as details and trying to imagine this being used by somebody. Um, as long as you don't think about it too hard and just want to use it as a quick encounter, I suppose it would do. But this would not be ideal for a home for player characters, for instance. They would probably try to put in another, uh, an oven perhaps, and turn this into a kitchen. Also, this doesn't show interior doorways, so it's going to rely on the player's uh, either imaginations or the game master to post where doorways to different rooms would be. That is an unfortunate weakness. Here we can also see one of the major issues that I have with this work. As you can see here, we have the outer wall. It goes right to the edge of the map and does not continue. Clearly, this is not the outer wall, but the formatting is poor. The entirety of the map does not fit within the space of the pages, which makes it look a bit less quality. Uh, quite honestly, it is a bit disappointing when he had this space in the middle here that he could have cropped to make more room for the actual building that is the feature of this work. The, you will see this on other maps as well. As we go through, we see a training area. A training area, barracks, uh, office, nothing, nothing too out of the ordinary there. A very nice arena. This is very well done. Uh, looks good. It's a, a bit on the small side, but that way your com your combatants can't run away from each other forever. Uh, you aren't going to set up major battles in this, but something a little bit more personal. One-on-one, -on -one, two two-on-two, say four-on-four -four combat. Anything more than that, it's going to get very, very crowded very quickly. But it's well done. Very nice. The uh, grill in the middle could let monsters up or give a place to plow the bloodied sand out. Here we go with the rooftop area, a dynamic setting that a lot of game masters sometimes miss as far as opportunities for dynamic combat. But we see uh, lots of rooftops, open alleyways where people can fall, um, battles can be fought up on here, certainly with a high risk of failure if you fall. An ice flow. 
large solid ice berg or ice shelf and here you have the water with broken up ice pack uh, this could uh, create a dynamic battle where individual units jump between ice flow to ice flow to ice flow with the possibility of falling into frigid water at any opportunity also all the hazards of being on an ice shelf and treacherous terrain and you have yourself a battle that is difficult to contain um, that may lead to extra complications and, well, quite honestly, something the players have to work around. Here we have a nautical encounter area, one of the major reasons that this book was purchased. Uh, nice ship layout, and this area just begging for bands of Zawajan raiders, or a kraken, or sea serpents, or some such, to attack the boat. And you have all the options of laying it out. The draft of the boat itself works fairly well as a generic large ship. Uh, no uh, top-mounted cannons that you can see here, although you could add those you at your leisure if you wished, uh, either by... Uh, using some of the stickers for cannons or you know, cra drafting your own cannon miniatures. Um, but again, uh, opens up a lot of possibilities. This open water expanse is perfect for water battles. Nothing much to say here, it's just how often do you actually have a sheet textured for water that's gridded for combat. It's useful to have, certainly. Nice to pull out when you're planning that big nautical battle especially when your players have alternate means of travel, such as flying carpets or flight spells or a wind chariot or some such. A battle in a graveyard. Again, textures are a little muddied here, but this is actually one of the better of the maps. Again, the openness actually works for its benefit. Again, downside, the mausoleum at the end. The map just simply stops right after the sarcophagus at the end. Um, again, this, this formatting issue will keep coming up. And here we have, this is a uh, another tavern. Uh, downstairs and upstairs. How big is it? We can't tell because, again, this has been cut off. This one is rather poorly formatted before there is clearly quite a bit yet over here that we are not going to see. Likewise, we're not sure... Uh, how much more is here. Although if we compare it, it's not that much of a cutoff. But it's still irritating. It uh, looks like a, a, about three feet on either side cut off. N is it tragic? No. Can you still use it? Yes. And having multiple, having a tavern, having an inn, having a layout like that can be very handy. So I will, again, uh, grumble a bit, but will still be using this. It's also nice to have individual bedrooms, although um, this would be a, a fairly uh, packed place with four tiny little beds. They're only, according to the grid, about five feet long, so any of your taller characters are going to have their feet sticking out quite a ways. Or oh, these are halfling-sized rooms. I suppose you could uh, settle for that. Uh, the white beds are certainly a bit larger, and we see a lot of cut and paste here in his layout, which is fine. I don't begrudge him that. Uh, but yes, lots of cut and paste. Twin hobbit-sized beds. Again, this would be a good one for someplace in the Shire. So. Uh, here we see a cliffside encounter. Waterfall coming down. Um... Again, we get spray by a very bad mudding, muddling effect. Um, the blur is you know, on all the terrain is, is quite bad. Um, you don't get a sense so much as these are individual bushes, as it is some sort of lichen or something. Overall, the entire texture of this is, is quite poor, with the exception of this bridge, which is still well laid out. You can see wood grain texture, but here you can't see much more than the large cracks. Um, all in all, this one is, is quite poor. And here again we see a, uh, a blurring in some areas. The sides of the detailing of the ship um, do showing damage and in some cases the inner sides of the ship, but rather than some of the crisp detailing we've seen, uh, instead we see a bit of low resolution popping in here and there. 
Although, as far as having a beach encounter near a shipwreck, this would be quite serviceable. Uh, certainly wouldn't mind pulling it out in a tropical expanse with a pine tree or palm trees uh, dotting here and there. Here we have an underground cavern area. Uh, this is called the Rhinestone Caverns. There are crystals in one chamber. Um, I believe a staircase coming in. Uh, looks like some sort of uh, pool here. Um, some uh, floor to ceiling pillars and open areas uh, begging for more exploration. Again, cuts off on the end here. We're getting used to that. And the this does uh, extend outward. Interesting to note, um, here we have two of these uh, books. So we could take this and match it up with the second book and have this mirrored on itself or for wider, more expansive uh, conflicts, uh, which was a feature that they advertised that we fell in with, but uh, now that we see how big this book is, it almost seems a little foolish. This is an underground center, like a, a, a sewer, large drain, areas that both look like they were excavated out, or cellars of uh, buildings above. Uh, this would be a good place for my were friend here to scurry around, and it creates a dynamic combat setting. Again, resolutions are a little muddied here, going from quite crisp and sharp, showing uh, different details within, to kind of muddied and murky, but muddy and murky works in an underground setting a bit better. Here we have an alchemist's uh, tower. Uh, numerous points where you can go up into the tower, these rounded staircases, which are illustrated just fine, and bric-a-brac that uh, an alchemical furnace here, for instance, uh, work tables, desk, um, bed, again, this bed is about 13 feet long. Scaling is not our friend here. Uh, the chests are huge. I don't mind the workbenches being large, but uh, yeah, here we have the 12 foot long, for, uh, about yeah, 13 foot long desk. I wish I had a 13 foot long desk, but uh, I don't. So uh, this was probably done for making things a bit more visible, but the scaling is a bit off. That's just how it is here. This is the Temple of Moradin. This is, in my humble opinion, the finest of these maps. Uh, you have here a very dynamic, geometric, and organized, symmetrical uh, temple layout. Uh, rows of candles would be here. The large altar at the end. It fits mostly within the bounds of the the book, showing porticos off to the side for alternate ways in. This whole front was obviously finished, but chopped off for this effect, um, which is probably unfortunate. I know uh, encounters that I've had in temples and shrines have taken place out in the portico, uh, in the front of a, of a temple, but for what it is, this is quite good. It is rather dark, however, and difficult to see some detail, but... All in all, I do appreciate what is there. The detail is not very uh, diminished for the fa fact that it is dark, and it looks quite nice. Here we have a country farmer's market. Uh, huge uh, stalls that would be put up to sell produce. Uh, a few buildings on the outskirts that look a little bit rough. Uh, so this would definitely be for a smaller village. All in all, not too bad. Not too bad at all. Here we come to what's called the fashion market. And here's where another th uh, the weakness of Mr. Yarrow shows itself. You have a street, supposedly. It's quite narrow for a fashion district, but eh, fair enough. But here you see, here is an entryway where you would conduct business. It has a counter, a table, uh, display cases. And then you have a bedroom area and a storage room. Well, if you have, want to have your bedroom right off of the uh, workplace, I, I suppose you could. There's nothing stopping you, but it seems foolish. Perhaps an upper floor or having a residence somewhere else, but all of these have the same layout. And then, right next to it, assuming it's on the same street, no, you have the shop on this side, 
which would be the back wall of this shop, and you have the bedroom right there and the storage room right there. So there is no matching from one building to the other. And then that's reversed for the other side. Here you have the main sales area, but on this one, the main sales area is on the back. So it's strange. As far as a layout, usually when you travel down, you would see the uh, shops competing with each other and having their wares one after the other, not the front of the store and then the back of a store right next to it. This is odd as far as the decision goes. This probably would be best, again, if you just took it as one building on its own and didn't interact with the rest of the street. Also, this is another one that falls victim to being cut off on the backside of each of the buildings. Um, so, again, this is a strange uh, decision. And here we have the Alchemist Library. Uh, magical orbs providing light. I like it. V various nice effects. Um, it's uh, glowing tomes just kind of hovering there. A little workshop area. Um, this is fine. It's dynamic. It le leads you to move around and have encounters in this space. Um, although the, it's quite cramped. The area between the shelves is only about three feet. So you're going to be a little tight. Uh, so, yes, all in all, uh, an interesting map, certainly. Then we come to the Haunted Manor. Again, chopped off at the bottom. But uh, uh, right down here, it's cut off. You'll have to take my word for it. Uh, and we see some of the other assets reused. We have the gazebo here again, as we saw in the hedge maze. But this has a nice breakup of patterns of the one would assume the carpeting, um, to add a kind of a gloomy and dismal sense of decay. Uh, he, he actually uses texturing here quite well to show worn areas or places where nature and the grave are kind of taking this place back. Some of the rooms are a little unusual to try to figure out exactly what their purpose was, but um, not a terrible map all in all if you need a haunted house. Uh, you could do a lot worse than this one. An underwater scene. Don't get many of those, so this one is quite nice. Until you see some of the scaling again. You have a chest here that is easily 10 to 12 feet, if not more. Um, the ship is broken in pieces, which is fine. It makes for a fine wreck. Um, you're underwater, so there is a general haze about the resolution of it all. It's all in rather low detail, and some of the artistry is not excellent as far as uh, perceptions go and horizon lines, but it, it's it's not bad. It's, it's certainly usable. It's very colorful. I do appreciate that. Um, and again, this does beg for underwater exploration and adventure. Uh, Bandit Camp serviceable if a bit murky, especially the foliage is very, very, well, just kind of uh, more of an abstract painter's uh, impressions of foliage. But again, uh, not terrible. Not a lot of bandits are going to be here, of course, and they put up uh, quite a bit of work for just three tents, but uh, it wouldn't be a bad uh, place for a squad of, say, 12 to 15 raiders, bandits, to work out in shifts out of and have a defensive fallback. You could also have a small orc warband do the same. So I, I appreciate the usefulness of this. It looks like it's a fairly nice uh, place, although there's nothing over here for defenses. There's just a few barrels, so it seems like it would be easy to slip into this camp. But uh, it's, it's fairly decent. Here we have a prison. I like this prison. It is edged all the way around, so you don't have to worry about cutoffs. Um, art is a bit crude here. Um, we have really thick walls with minimal de de uh, detailing. The detailing is ra rather modeled and uh, crude uh, compared to some of the maps that we have seen. These cells are absolutely enormous. You think they're 25 feet by 15 feet across. Um, that would be enough to house several people. 
so large spacious cells um, again the artistry here for the uh, prisoners in chains is very crude um, relative to what we've seen before but it could be a lot worse it's not all cut and pasted which I can appreciate um, you have the massive chair with nails um, the rack for stretching people uh, table for individual acts of torture, cages, uh, all very evocative of the bad time somebody is going to have in this. So, again, the artistry is not excellent, but uh, this would work quite well for some sort of, uh, well, it's a role-playing encounter that could be very memorable, possibly. Here we have an amazing scene, a, a hellscape, if you will, a volcanic rock, a large arcane sigil, uh, lava coming out of some sort of a head here at the side, some sort of a weeping fire giant. It it's, uh, certainly would make for a battlefield that would be challenging uh, for many. Could this be the home of a red dragon, for instance? Um, Certainly, there's a lot that comes to mind that you could do with something like this to create a new battlefield for your players. Here we have an open area for large-scale battles, or one that you can dress up. But uh, a couple of trees for interest points, but other than that, wide open space for uh, combat or large field spell play. And then the last page we have is a just a dungeon floor completely clear, waiting for you to put walls in place, or I could put 3D dungeoning elements in here to use the floor to show that all I need is wall instead, and I can make use of the lines that are there. Or maybe it's a huge room, and I can use this as just a large scale space to have a, a brawl um, without having to use just a paddle mat. I can use this and still get a good sense of where everybody is. I can draw on this with my dry erase marker and you know, have a battle that's uncomplicated by excess graphics. So those are the maps and those are my impressions of the contents of the immersive battle maps. So we have the immersive battle maps, um, an interesting enough product. Now. Before I used to go on a point-by-point -point basis on a strictly pass-fail. In this case, I don't think that's quite appropriate. I think that a proper grade on a scale of 1 to 10 would be better. But I will tell you what puts everything into that scaling so you can appreciate it for yourself. First of all, as far as the composition of the piece, there's a large range of different maps, many of which are not easy to find a, uh, a rival example. The underwater map, for instance, I don't think I've seen very many of those. The bandit camp having it pressed and ready for you, um, again, very, very handy. Uh, some of the, the haunted house, for instance. I could find haunted house maps, but on... Uh, something that I could use these stickers for, or just to be able to pop out at a moment's notice. Not so much. Uh, so as far as the creativity and everything that went into it, uh, I would have to say that Mr. Yarrow had a dream, and in his dream he had lots of different options for game masters to use to impress and uh, to challenge their players. And in that, I think... That is a success. So I would at least give it a 2.5 for just that, that it does what it's supposed to do. Gives you a range of maps and environments that you can challenge your players with, and it does a good job. Obviously, they're tilted towards fantasy or nature settings. Um, that's perfectly fine for fantasy adventures. If he does future ones, perhaps he'll have one for science fiction. I can think of genres like Warhammer 40,000 that would, uh, having 30 different maps in support of a gritty science fiction future setting would be very welcome. So I'm going to start at 2.5 there, he's accomplished that. 
as far as the quality of the art involved and the illustration, I'm going to have to give it a, a point for that. Instead of the full 2.5, I'll give it a point because, as I said, uh, some of it is quite good. Almost, I would say, too very good. Is it fine art? Mm, yeah, don't know if i go that far. It's certainly usable, but in many cases there's a lot of copy-paste, uh, some of them that weren't done with, as clearly done with a computer, um, almost go to the point of being you know, MS Paint quality, uh, which is unfortunate because I think a consistency of art would have definitely helped to punch this up a little bit, as it's only a few pieces that are really noticeable for being muddy, low resolution. Um, I'm not going to, you know, savage it. I'm a little disappointed, but it could have been far worse. Actually, I'll give it 1.5. So that brings us up to a solid uh, 4 so far. Then we have to consider how well the piece was crafted. As far as you know, physical structure, it's a fine book. Uh, I'm a little bit worried that it'll get digged up quite quickly. These books uh, mar quite, quite readily, but from what's here, solid spine, uh, well constructed uh, in purpose to bear the, you know, the miniatures that you will use. As far as having stickers to support, giving you some flexibility in your design, that's a plus there. Um, all in all, as far as how it all works together and supports a game and giving you range for encounters, I'll give it the full 2.5 there. We're up to 6.5. Finally, it comes down to how ready was this to go out? How, how usable is it? And quite honestly, this work is quite solid. You can take this book, drop it in front of a group of people, and instantly get the wow factor. You could even possibly have areas preloaded with your stickers all laid out so when you open it up, the encounter is right there in front. Merely put the miniatures in place and you're ready to go. I don't know if you can draw on it and then open it up. I suspect that would leave a muddled mess on both sides of the work. If you, they found a way to do that, that would be you know, even more useful. But with something like this, that you could quickly just dash in, draw any kind of illustrations that you needed above and beyond what you had stickers for, or the very art itself gave you, um, it's, it's quite good. Very good, I would say. The only downside, of course, is the formatting is, well, wasn't quite done perfectly. Uh, I can understand that this is a freshman effort. Uh, I don't know what other things Mr. Yarrow has, has, has ever done, and for her first time, this is excellent. However, we have to be somewhat objective when we criticize. And as far as, you know, leaving open edges on the sides of the map where rooms just aren't finished. Uh, in some cases, that's that's a bit of a mark against it. It doesn't stop the map from being useful. It merely you know, punches small holes in the immersion as you have edges on the side of the map where there's nothing to, no boundary that your mind craves when you imagine yourself in a room. Um, that is a decided weakness to it. Uh, is it crucial? Not terribly. Uh, the fact, all the other usefulness that you get out of it is uh, more than makes up for that. But I'd say it's a, a half a point against it. Uh, certainly it's, it's something that you would have wanted to have seen in a finished product. All of the maps complete, laid out, and formatted to fit inside of the book. So I'll give two points for that. I'll take off half a point for the formatting. That leaves this product up to an 8.5, which is very good. It is a good value. If I wasn't bonded to my battle mat years ago, I might, if I enjoyed more theater of the mind things, probably be blown away by something like this that would make the necessity of imagining things a bit less if I can instantly break out something that will invoke 
and immerse my players to the scenario that I'm setting up. That is a very valuable trait that you can use in your games, and this book brings that. Uh, yes, there are some warts. There often are, especially, as I said, first effort. I trust that uh, Yarrow Studios' next offerings will show a little bit more care to be finished and uh, polished a little bit more. But for the most part, well, I can't wait to show my players this and um, you know, let them tremble at the sight of the fearsome uh, encounter locations or enjoy the tactical side of combat with being able to see where all of their characters and their foes are arranged so that they can use those skills that they have to uh, employ for the benefit of their characters and hopefully their triumph in future stories. So, yeah, solid 8.5. That's, uh, that's a very good product. As far as the value, I believe this costs... Oh, let me see. I believe they have set a price on this for $55 or $45. If you consider that with this, you have no need of a battle mat... You know, those rolled-up things that have all the grids. Uh, and you can enjoy a textured layout that you can put your figures on. Uh, one of those battle mats usually goes for as much as, um, say, 35 for a fairly good-sized one. Um, probably as low as 20 to $25 for one that would fit over this map. Those would not have the colored textures. They would not have all of the different layouts. You would have to draw those in yourself for needing or wanting extra supplies to kind of make that display pop would set you back a fair amount more. If you were going to a superior 3D dungeoning layout, uh, even if you printed it yourself, uh, the cost on it would probably be comparable and you'd have to have quite a few different layouts to make up for what you can get with this value here. The size, the stability, even the stickers are something to consider. I consider it a decent value. If you are going to use miniatures, then something like this can certainly be an ideal stopgap between, say, full layout encounters, uh, for example, a boss battle scenario that you might be wanting to use more than something like this, certainly. But there's going to be any number of encounters, um, whether it be a wandering monster, whether it be something transitory in your journeys, that having something like this means you don't just have to look at a plain beige battle mat and whatever marker sketches the Game Master puts onto it. So, uh, I think it's a fairly good value. I'm certainly not disappointed that I have access to this one. And it's mate right over there. So, I am the Omnis Critic, and I have found this item to be good. Uh, you shall rush out and get one. If you use miniatures and you have a value for something for uh, encounter-based scenarios. Um, of course, if you go all in and have massive 3D structures, well, this is going to be a bit underwhelming, but much easier to travel with. So, I am the Omnis Critic, and thank you very much for joining me here once more. And until next time we queue up something for proper criticism, well, cheers. <laughs>